chapter three, the British Atlantic world, 1660, 1750. So we're talking about uh, Britain, the English colonies being firmly entrenched by now. And this is where they come to great power. And the British Atlantic world is talking about their trade system and the, and the, uh, you know, the, the world of commerce that they have uh, that regards the new world and how the new world fits into, into this and makes them very, very wealthy. So we see the rise of the British Empire become the you know superpower of the world in this time, this, in this time frame. This era leads up to this, these, this French and Indian War era that, of course, uh, you're going you're gonna to have a war with the French to determine who's going to control the uh, lands that would become the United States, okay? So as this, as this country gains in strength and power and in and, and commerce and trade and so on, um, of course, how, you know, what, what's the result of that? Native Americans' future is very bleak. Uh, they're dying from disease. They, they can't really mount a defense. Uh, they just can't stop these white people from taking over their lands. Uh, as the colonies became uh, entrenched, it became clear to the Native Americans that their future was bleak and the practice of broken promises, broken treaties was in full swing. Uh, they, they realized they couldn't trust really any of them. I, I mentioned before how the French accepted them better than the English. You don't get the idea that they were loved and you know seen as the answer. I mean, they, they weren't. The, the, the natives knew that the French had their agenda also and that they wanted to dominate the, con the continent. I'm going to read you a couple of quotes from two different Iroquois chiefs around the same time to give you an idea of the, the confusing state of the Native American world, okay? <clears throat> this is from Chief Gokradadin. You know very well, when the white people came first, here they were poor, but now they have got our lands and are by them become rich, and we are now poor. What little we have had for the land goes soon away, but the land lasts forever. So in the, beginnings, the, in, in the beginning, the whites were weak, and they needed help. The natives could have killed them, Get rid of them. Who are these people? But they didn't. They reacted with kindness and sympathy. And I guarantee you there probably isn't one that's alive today that wishes that they hadn't done that, that they, they had killed them. If you, if you just killed them as they came, when you had the power to do it, they wouldn't have taken hold so much, okay? Uh, here's another quote from another another uh, Iroquois chief, uh, Kanasatoga. Um we shall never forget that you and we have but one heart, one head, one eye, one ear, one hand. We shall have all your country under our eye and take all the care we can to prevent any enemy from coming into it. Uh, it's actually pronounced kind of Satego. Okay? You have the two different kind of contradictory quotes here. One, one is, one is, you know, kind of you know, uh, maligning the people and I don't, we don't like you and we were kind to you and you and you hurt us back and that wasn't nice. <clears throat> this person here is saying that we are of you. We're, we're like brothers. Okay, so so two conflictive statements made at the same time by two different chiefs from the same confederation. So this these two quotes speak volumes to the struggle that went on in, in Native American minds as their world was trampled over. <clears throat> And how confusing and frustrating these times were for them, okay? Let's start our class today with a crash course film. Uh, please watch the film entitled The Natives and the English, Crash Course, U.S. History Number 3, and then come on back. Okay, so Native alliances were very important to the colonists. Uh, and the Iroquois, unlike most other tribes we know, went with the French became allied to the English. So they're, they're the exception. The Iroquois are the, are, is the one tribe that went with the English. Of course, they're not just one tribe. They're a huge confederation, okay? So, so the, you have this era, if you're a Native American person in this era, or a tribe, <clears throat> or a people, you are in constant state of change. You have this clash with these Europeans. It's, they're dominating you mostly because of disease. And the natives are constantly uh, forced to react to the whims of the Europeans, trying to find their place in the new order. 
And as we know, many had died from disease, leaving some as a vanished, a vanished people, and they left no trace. Okay, with them went the oral histories, so we know nothing of these people. Uh, so what do, we, do I mean by oral histories? Well, well, versus written histories, okay? Written histories, of course, you write it down. Oral histories, you pass stories on to your family and your children to, for them to pass down to their children. So your history, your culture is passed on through oral histories, okay? Uh, so this system has been criticized in the past by historians <clears throat> and considered not a legitimate system until recently. It was thought if it wasn't written down, it wasn't real. It was just mythology and that it wasn't accurate. Um, so it was seen as not a good system. Of course, you know, people can write down whatever they want, right? They, they, just because it's written down doesn't mean it's true. You've got to uh, do research into whether you whether you read something or hear something to see if it's true or, or find the truth, truth in it, okay? <clears throat> because the natives used oral history as a way to pass down their um, history, they were, they were looked down on, okay? Um, the, these people weren't sophisticated enough to, to write their stories down. It's not really the case. It's just that's the way that they did it, okay? Uh, but the bottom line is, is because so many of these people died, we don't know that much about them and their tribes. Uh, in, in a typical fashion, you know, the elders of the tribe would – would pass the stories down to the to the young people and they would pass it to the next generation. But now the elders are gone. And as well as many of the many of the young people who would have heard these stories and passed them down. So gone forever was the foundation of a strong future complete with their history. Okay. Uh, so what happened is many of these tribes were reduced greatly. So and some weren't, and and who knows why? Some some sort of mechanism in their biology that just made them not be affected by these diseases. But if you were in a tribe that reduced down to two or three people, and your neighbor had forty, you would probably join them. Okay, uh, new tribes from the remnants of decimated ones, and this is called tribalization. So it's not always a good thing. Again, the Europeans tended to believe that these people were all the same. Same customs, same religions. You know, we, you know, white people today still think that that people of color are all the same. Okay, um, this is called tribalization. In one of your terms, what is that? The adaptation of stateless peoples to the demands on them by neighboring states. So, stateless people would be, would be, if my tribe, you know, was was reduced to two or three of us. I'm stateless. I, I don't have a tribe or a place to go to, but my neighbors got 30 or 40. I go over to them. But now I have to adapt to the way they are and, and the demands that, <clears throat> that they'll put on me, their culture, their language, their religion. Okay. Uh, so I can't be firm enough about the impact of disease. It was the single most important event of European contact. Hands down, nothing else comes close. Okay, it's not it's not the subject that most history books in the past like to talk about. Uh, they throw it in that it happened here and there, but no, it wasn't a small thing. It was absolutely devastating. And we're going to talk more about that in this chapter. Okay, so if you're if you're native, who do you form an alliance with? You probably have to choose one. <clears throat> These people are powerful. They're taking over. And we're dying. And we can't stop them. So what do we do? We, we probably should ally with one of them. Um, I mean, wouldn't either one spell doom for them in the end? I mean, probably. Um, some, felt, some felt it was best to ally with who you thought would win, get on the winning side. That way, you know, if you supported them, they would be, they would be uh, nicer to you. Uh, <clears throat> others felt it was best to ally with the people that you had the best relationship with. So as, as we know, most went with the, with the French because they were less judgmental, less harsh to the natives. They accepted the, the native ways, okay? <clears throat> so you have kind of a squaring off of these two groups. Uh, most of the natives, you know, are in alliance with the Catholic French in, in Canada, upstate New York, versus the Protestant English in New England that would ally with the Iroquois. You set the stage for these four French and Indian wars, okay, that we're getting, that we're heading towards. Uh, we're not going to do it in this chapter, but very soon. <clears throat> so why was it called the French and Indian War? It's kind of an interesting way uh, way to 
uh, name a war. Uh, it wasn't the French fighting the Indians, not that that didn't happen on some level, but it's called that because that's who the English fought. Okay, they fought the French, they fought the Indians. So it'd be like calling World War II the German and Japanese War, okay? Okay, as, and as we already have said before, uh, these four wars will span 75 years. But the truth is, there were raids and, and you know, conflicts going on <clears throat> always. Uh, as you see in these, in this set, as you'll find out in these 75 years, these four wars are parts of that. But this, in the 75 year period, the, the raids never really stop. Okay, and even though war might be declared or not, the, the raids don't stop. And these are raids from the uh, Canadian, French, Indians coming south into the English frontiers and and raiding people and kidnapping and killing and burning and pretty awful. But don't get the idea that it just happened that way because the English did the same thing back. So both sides raided each other and committed atrocities, okay? One of the more famous ones is the Deerfield Raid, Raid on Deerfield 1704, okay? Uh, this is where the native uh, natives with the French allies come into Deerfield, Massachusetts, kill dozens of English uh, settlers, colonists, and took over 100 captives. 100 captives taken. One of the more shocking raids, and you know, kind of starts a chain reaction. Of course, it had been going on for a while. So, where are these wars taking place? And we, we, we've seen the big map of, of how large New France was, how small uh, New England was, or I should say the 13 colonies. This is a present day map of New York to just kind of give you a better familiarity to it. So, if you look at the map of New York, at the bottom, of course, is New York City, the largest city in the country today. Okay, not necessarily then. But down here is New York, this great harbor, okay, access to the Atlantic. And then you've got the Hudson River that goes north all the way up into the upstate New York and Vermont up towards Lake Champlain, Lake George, okay? So right here is Albany, and I've mentioned that before. Albany at that time, in, in our era, the, the early 18th century, late 17th century, this is, the, this is the farthest north that English settlement was, okay? Albany was was kind of like the, the the fringe of the frontier. Okay, to the left, all the way across, all the way over to the lakes, Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, as we've seen, are the Iroquois. So again, another reason why the Iroquois and the English became partners is because they were neighbors. You've got you've got the English settlement up here and the Iroquois here. Okay, so any anything above Albany, all the way up into Canada, is I'm sorry, after a buffer zone called the frontier line right here, uh, kind of a no man's land, but a buffer between the two, you, you have the French and their Indian allies. But most of these four wars were, were based around these raids coming both ways, whether they were French raiding the, the frontier or the English raiding the frontier. Okay, both sides did it. Okay, not, not to suggest there wasn't any battles anywhere else, and some of these became world wars, but for our purpose and what was important in the colonies, the biggest problem was frontier raids back and forth that were, of course, not making it very safe for really anybody, okay? Okay, um, so in retaliation to Deerfield, uh, the English colonists attacked French posts, Port Royal, Nova Scotia. So, you know, history is full of eye for an eye retaliations. Sometimes history can feel like it's an endless stream, stream of, of trivial battles. It's like two two boys in the schoolyard. Okay, kind of kind of an immature kind of way to go about it. But yet here we do it. And we still do it, right? We still we still have overreactions and we respond with great violence and aggressiveness if we feel somebody wrongs us. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of negotiation, discussion, and 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 um, you know, uh, talking back and forth. We just, we just tend to strike, okay? Okay. Um, so we talked about the Iroquois, uh, this large confederation along along this lake up here, most, mostly Lake Ontario, and they would also kind of inhabit the lands over towards Lake Champlain. And they, they became um, partners with the English, unlike most of the other tribes, okay? Uh, but initially, they, they declared neutrality, Um 
they had trade agreements with both Europe, I'm sorry, both England and France, okay? So they somewhat supported both or either or neither when it suited them. They were large enough. They, they didn't have to fear the English or the French as much as the other tribes did. Even though decimated also, they still were large enough because of the Confederacy encouraged and inspired by Hiawatha. Uh, they, they remained powerful, okay? So the, the natives lived a different culture, obviously, than the Europeans did, and the Iroquois no different, okay? Um, natives lived uh, in groups called clans, okay? So, so a group of native people would be a tribe, okay? But a group of tribes would be a clan. So this could be a fair amount of people. Uh, so a, a, uh, a clan is a group of close-knit, interrelated tribes, people with a common interest, okay? And as we know, the, the Iroquois, the five nations, uh, Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, One, Oneida, Mohawk, uh, this confederation of five tribes, and this is somewhat like a clan, okay? Uh, and they develop relationships with other tribes in the confederacy through a series of what are called real and fictive kinships, okay? <clears throat> Okay, so this slide, don't, don't be too concerned with, with these words uh, on sanguinal and, and so on. Let me just explain what I'm talking about here. So a real, a real kinship is through birth or blood. Okay, you don't have to know those other words. Uh, birth or blood or marriage is fine. Okay, that's a real kinship. I mean, it makes sense. It's like, like we live today. You, your family, your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your aunts, your uncles, that's blood relations, but then your sister marries somebody that becomes your your brother-in-law, and he's family too. So those are real kinships, okay? But they also have what's called fictive kinships, okay? So a fictive kinship refers to people that are unrelated by birth or marriage, but these fictive ties still had an emotionally significant relationship with the people in the tribe. These fictive kinships would take on characteristics of a family and a tribal relationship. Fictive ties were as important as relationships created by blood, marriage, or adoption, and were not any less important. Okay, so who were these fictive people? What am I talking about? These are these are typically captives. Natives took captives to replace their own dead, and we'll talk about the story of Mary Jemison at the end of this chapter. Um, Okay, so what is so okay? So they're so they're prisoners of war, or or they're they're captives. Uh, why they do that? What's what does this have to do with fictive kinships? Well, it was believed in the native culture that if a tribe had had been at war with another tribe or a European country, and let's say they the ten of their people were killed in, in, in this battle, then they felt their opponents owed them ten people replace the people that had been killed. So the Iroquois would then raid, and this is a, a, a large reason why they raided, to replace their dead. Uh, they would raid and take 10 people with them. They would probably take 20 and kill off 10 and choose the, the, the 10 that they felt were the, were the best replacement, okay? So the Iroquois society was built in this fashion, okay? Not an obsession with bloodlines, like their European counterparts, okay? <clears throat> okay, so the English and the Iroquois come together finally, and the Iroquois side with them, but they're so different. You know, how do we how do we maintain our ties? How do we renew our alliance? You know, how do we not lose each other because we don't we don't mix well, we don't meet on many levels except we have this, you know, uh, need to come together uh, to help each other. Uh, so what they would do is they would meet in Albany. Remember, I said Albany was the farthest north uh, uh, English settlement. Above that's the frontier. So the Iroquois and the English would meet once a year in Albany. Um, to renew the terms of their alliance, to renew covenants they'd formed together, to interact in friendship uh, the best they could. So what's one way that, that a group of men can interact in friendship? male bonding, you drink, you carouse, right? So, the, so these meetings became really uh, uh, maybe a week or so of, of drinking, carousing, and building bonds between these different types of men. Uh, so it was felt that these 
terms of alliance and the duties of each party need to be repeated and reaffirmed. Any breaches or disagreements need to be explained and amends made for them. This is really a, an Iroquois custom. They use the same process with their dealings uh, with other tribes or, or any European people outside their confederacy. And if they were accepted and brought in, they didn't have to always be kidnapped. It might just be a, you know, a relationship. Each new partner was given a kinship term, brother, uncle, father, nephew, whatever, sister, to designate the nature of their relationship to the Iroquois. So some were more important than others, okay, depending on what name they got, okay? Okay, so another reason the Iroquois did not ally with France was because they were a powerful confederation that had plans of their own initially. Because of their size and strength, they could stand up to the European powers. Uh, so the English treated them with respect because they were kind of intimidating. So even though we, we mentioned before how the natives did not respect the natives at all and, in fact, despised them, not the case with the Iroquois, I, I, again, initially anyway. Uh, they, they saw them with respect, and this is what, resulted in a successful relationship. This would prove to be a, a value to the English because most of the, I'm sorry, because the Iroquois tribe would side with them in the French Indian Wars and the American Revolution, where, of course, everybody else, for the most part, went with the French. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, so you have this, you have this exception here of, of especially English ethnocentricity, or we know that there's European ethnocentricity. Exploration quickly turned to conquest, gave rise to an ethnocentric feeling of European superiority. We've talked about this, uh, you know, this, these notions that the, that the Europeans had, had, the, had the right to native lands, you know, uh, ordained by God. Uh, God told them that the natives should be your subjects. Uh, so ethnocentric, but yet here you have a situation where you don't have that. You have respect. So this is one of the only uh, examples where the English have a respect for native people. Okay, <clears throat> so I mentioned that the Iroquois were related to New York, and this is a this is a, a a map of where they all were, and for the most part, you see that that is the map of the current day state of New York. So the state of New York's boundaries are are related to uh, native uh, tribes boundaries of in that time okay uh, so, the, so you developed a good relationship with English because your neighbors uh, and you would so the natives would seek guns ammunition military support for their wars against the French and their native allies if, if these issues led to difficulties the Iroquois used their English allies in New York to help resolve matters and the English in turn <clears throat> used their connection with the Iroquois to promote trade and their imperial ambitions at the expense of other colonies, okay? Okay, so before we get too far away from this subject, um, we've talked about disease a lot, and we need to because it's the most important thing, as I've said. Um, I want to just uh, make it clear about you know how this all works and fill in some gaps that maybe you, you, you have a question about, okay? So let's do a supplemental lecture number four right here, the impact of disease. So what I'm going to do here is talk to you about not just that they came in disease killed people, but why did they have these diseases? Where did these diseases come from? Why did the Europeans have all these diseases that they brought? What's the history of that? Okay. So before we start, okay, let's go ahead and watch the, the next Crash Course film. It's called Disease. Crash Course, World History 203. Please watch that, and then we'll come back and start this lecture, okay? <clears throat> okay, uh, supplemental lecture number four, the impact of disease. Okay, so let's do our sketch outline. Number one, background development. Let's say letter A, uh, it would be disease related to animals. Letter B would be the Dark Ages, okay? Number two is Black Death. Letter A, 40 million die. Letter B, they gain immunities. Okay. Number three is the New World, a small force of uh, Europeans. Letter B, disease, a silent weapon. 
okay? So one more time on our, on our sketch outline. Number one, background development. Letter A, disease related to animals. Letter B, dark ages. <clears throat> number two, black death. Letter A, 40 million die. Uh, number, uh, letter B, uh, immunities are gained. Uh, number three, new world. Letter A, small force. Letter B, disease, a silent weapon. <laughs> okay, the relevance of the lecture and some of this is review. Um, we're, you know, we're going a different direction with disease, but some of it will be review. Okay, uh, Not exactly a great conquest. It was pure luck, and they had no idea what happened. Most historians today would agree. A toe-to-toe -to -toe battle with the Aztecs, we're talking about the Spanish and Aztecs here, a toe-to-toe -to -toe battle with the Aztecs at full strength would have resulted in the defeat of the Europeans. This would have dramatically altered history. And it would have altered history everywhere because they died everywhere the Europeans came. If they didn't, they always had the numbers, the land, the defense, the fortifications. They would have probably defeated all of them. But because disease came with it, they, they couldn't mount a defense, okay? Okay, let's get started. So uh, looking at this image here, you see um, peasants lived in squalor with their animals. So you see that these, in, in these particular cases, these animals are inside these people's homes. So is it, is it possible to link this idea of animals living in your house or near your house with the conquest of the Americas? So that's kind of a reach, right? How could, how could animals live in your house and... 12th century have anything to do with the with the Europeans and the conquistadors in the 1500s conquering the Americas. But as you'll see, the truth is they are uniquely related. Okay, so how's that possible? Well, you're looking at peasants here in Europe. One of the reasons people came to America was land. You didn't have that much land in Europe. So the people, the peasants, the serfs, if they were lucky enough to have a shack with a little piece of land next to it, then they would put their animals outside, but not all did. You didn't have that much land. You didn't have any space outside to put your animals. So they actually lived inside the house with you. Okay? Uh, so this, this will create a unique kind of uh, situation in Europe that will result in much disease. Okay, So going, going back into disease here, of course, this, this is, we said, the biggest problem the, the natives had was was being ravaged by European diseases, okay? It had also happened to the Europeans already hundreds of years earlier. Uh, you have the Black Death. Uh, this event had a very long-lasting effect on many people for centuries to come in Europe, okay? Uh, so we've already talked about the three groups that came to the Americas, the three civilizations, the Europeans, the uh, indigenous people that were here and the Africans that were brought with the Europeans. Uh, so we know that the Europeans were different than the other two. We've talked about, we talked about the great empires in Africa, also the great empires in Mexico and South America. So highly advanced civilizations, some would say the most advanced in the world. In comparison with, with these two, the Europeans did not really match up near as well. And I, I, I realize we've talked about this. It's, to, it's still setting the stage for the direction of, and the argument I have about disease here, okay? So we know that the Europeans were coming out of a nearly thousand-year period of despair and lack, lack of progress after, after you know, gaining so much with the Greek and Roman empires, then it comes crashing down when Rome is, is uh, defeated. And the Europeans go into this long, long period of despair, lack of progress, dark ages. <clears throat> and people... Excuse me. People didn't bathe. They had rotted teeth, bad hygiene, filthy people, filthy cities. Cities were dirty. Uh, people ran around barefooted, filthy, didn't take baths. Uh, they would throw their human waste in the streets. So human waste, uh, feces, urine all over the streets. OK, uh, pools of it everywhere. So a very clean, I'm sorry, a very unclean <clears throat> environment. OK. <clears throat> So going back to the animals in the shacks, they, they treated their animals the same way. Filthy, not clean very often. Now, these animals also lived in their own filth. So if they if you happen to have the, the ability to put your animals outside, typically they were penned very close to your house. 
and these animals would would stand in their own filth all day long uh, because they 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 of course have have their waste products that falls in the ground. They're standing in it. Uh, it rains a lot in Europe. That, that kind of creates a muddy environment. So you're dirty, filthy with all this all these germs all over you. Okay. And in some cases, maybe you bring those animals in at night. So you're living amongst this kind of breeding ground for disease. And that's exactly what happened. Out of this environment came the bubonic plague or the black death, as well as many others. But it all comes from living in a filthy environment. The African empires and the and the Mexican empires, South American empires, and North American empires didn't, didn't do that. Tribes didn't do that. They didn't live like that, okay? So the Black Death comes to Europe and uh, killed 40 million out of 90 million people. So nearly half the people in Europe died, mostly white people. In three very short years, so absolute devastation, okay? But 50 million survive. And why? Nobody really knows. Some built-in defense. Uh, but, but the key here is this. Once you survive a disease or an epidemic, gain an immunity to it. So when I was young, coming up in the late 50s, early 60s, okay, and this probably went on to the 70s and 80s, um, when you were young, it was expected in, in my day that you would get the measles, the mumps, the chicken pox. Your parents expected it. It wasn't a big deal. that They'd put you down for a week and, and, and get you through it. But once, once you got through it, now you have an immunity to it. You don't have to worry about catching it again, okay? That's what happened to the Europeans that survived. You gain an immunity to the to these diseases. That means you'll, you'll never catch the uh, disease again. So these people became immune to these diseases. But, and this is very, very key, although immune, they remained carriers of the disease. And this, and this uh, uh, carrier aspect was passed down to their children. So generations later... Europeans have an immunity to these diseases, but they're also carriers, okay? So this is where this links how this animals in the house that creates disease, that creates an epidemic, that creates immunities. This is how it links to the conquest of the Americas by the white Europeans, okay? Uh, so again, if you study these three people, you, you determine that the Europeans were not the dominant one. In fact, most evidence to the contrary they would come in a distant third in that group if you were to rate them. So, so how did they do it? How did they manage to conquer and, and become dominant in the new world? Because they, because they came and brought disease. They didn't know they had them, but they brought them. So Native Americans began to perish from diseases that they'd never seen. Now, does that mean that they never had diseases before? No, they did. Native Americans have diseases but they're mostly STDs, syphilis, and that type of thing. Nothing of this great magnitude. So why was it different in Europe? Because Europe was a trading center that people from all over Africa, Asia, Europe came to, okay? The great trading centers. You remember the West African traders crossing the Trans-Saharan uh, the Trans-Saharan trade to get to European markets. People come from all over the, the Europe, Africa, Asia landmass to trade. So besides bringing all different goods, they bring all different germs to, to Europe. So Europe had, that was part of the problem also. Of course, the filthy aspect was, you know, created a breeding ground for it to get worse. Um, the, the natives didn't live like that. So uh, they, didn't ha they didn't have that filth, but also they didn't have great trading centers either. Most of the African traders went out to places, not people didn't come to them. Notice Lawn and the great Aztec and mine empires, they didn't go all over all, all of what be the United States and South America. They, they mostly stayed where they were. They had a powerful enough culture and civilization that they didn't have to go out. So that's that's a difference too. And another reason why Europeans had more diseases than the than the uh, natives did. Okay, but but mostly it was filth and different lifestyles. Okay. Uh, yes, the natives had animals, although and the Africans, but although it wasn't as important to them to domesticate animals, they lived different. Um, but they, they didn't keep them near them; they kept them far away. Okay, because they had land. Because in the in the 
native world, you know, let, let, there was no private property. So you could put your animals wherever you wanted and nobody cared. So this is a big part of why this happened, okay? Uh, so we, we know we've already learned that Cortez comes, Hernan Cortez, and uh, the, even, the, even though they far outnumbered them, they defeated them. We talked about the, why aren't there any books in the book, Barnes and Noble bookstore about the great battles of the Spanish and Aztec uh, wars, because there weren't any great battles, uh, because everyone died, okay? Uh, you can't mount a defense. You know, you might have a large number of people, but when it's reduced down to 10%, you don't have much of a defense, okay? So <clears throat> let me be clear here how this happened. The Europeans came. They were carriers of disease that they were now immune to. The Native Americans had not experienced these diseases because they didn't live in filth. They weren't trade centers. Uh, so they had not developed immunities, and they all died, or many died, okay? Uh, so before we end this, does that mean that they didn't have disease? Well, they did. And uh, let's watch a film here. Uh, so understand, when we're in the middle of a supplemental lecture, a film is designed to, of course, emphasize my point, make my point, help me make my argument. Uh, so anything in a film that you want to use in your essay, that's perfectly fine, okay? Let's, before we end this, watch this film called Why Native Americans Didn't Wipe Out Europeans with Diseases. See what the difference is, okay? and then come on back. Okay, so like I said before, Europe was a trade center and Tenochtitlan and other places were not, okay? Okay, so this is this is how it happened. This this is where the diseases came from. We already we learned before that they brought them, now we know where they came from, okay? So the relevance of the lecture that this this will be the end of this supplemental lecture. Uh, the relevance is not exactly a great conquest. It was pure luck and they had no idea what happened. Most historians today would agree a toe-to-toe -to -toe battle with the Aztecs at full strength would have resulted in the defeat of the Europeans or Spanish. This would have dramatically altered history. If disease, so that is the end of that lecture, okay? If disease hadn't been an issue, the Europeans would have probably been defeated. You know, what kind of world would we live in today? Uh, um, you know, very, very much a different one, okay? Okay, let's keep going here. Uh, so back to captivity and looking at fiction ships, uh, this idea that you raid to not only disrupt, but also to replace people that have been killed by your opponent. <clears throat> okay, so I've mentioned Mary Jemison a couple times. Uh, she, she was a 12-year-old girl, became captive in 1755 in the midst of the Fourth French and Indian War. So captured by Indians along the Pennsylvania border. I'm sorry, not border frontier during this French Indian War. Uh, uh, living on the frontier and, and a raiding party consisting of six Shawnee Indians and four Frenchmen captured Mary, her family, and a young boy from another family. So understand what I just said there. Um, uh, six Shawnee Indians, four Frenchmen. So four white men. So this wasn't all just, you know, savage Indians raiding because they had nothing better to do. The, the white Frenchmen did it also, and the English would do it the other way. So the white men were also raiding and committing atrocities also, okay? <clears throat> okay, so the Shawnee raiding party that captured Mary and her family uh, and this young other young boy from another family, they are taking them to Fort Duquesne, which is where present-day Pittsburgh is at, okay? Uh, Fort Duquesne, we'll talk more about when we start our discussion about the French and Indian Wars. <clears throat> Uh, so understand, na <clears throat> Native tribes, raiding parties, they capture white people, and they take them to a white fort first to, to figure out what to do with them. So the, my point is the, the Frenchmen, <clears throat> white people, were in complete you know, agreement with this practice and encouraged uh, kidnapping and captivity, okay? <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. On the way to Fort Duquesne, uh, as I mentioned before, many times the Tribes would kill off people that they didn't see as fit to be replacements. So Mary had to witness the killing of her mother, father, and siblings. So her entire family was killed before her eyes, and they were ritually scalped. Okay, so this is not a pretty picture for a 12-year-old girl to experience, okay? Uh, <clears throat> let's 
Somehow, Mary and the, and the young boy were spared, m likely because they were considered of suitable age for adoption. Another reason why you keep a young person over an older person is because they, you could you could form them. They were they were more impressionable. A 40 year old man would probably fight you, where where a 12 year old girl is going to acquiesce, okay, or a boy. <clears throat> so once they reached the fort. Uh, Mary was given to two Seneca, the Seneca tribe, you know, a tribe of the Iroquois. Uh, so again, they're, they're looking to replace siblings or lost spouses or whoever, you know, died in battles. Uh, and she was adopted by the Senecas. A, a, the Senecas took her into their tribe and she ended up growing up there throughout her teen years. And ultimately she married a Seneca man and raised a family. <clears throat> And this is all in the decades before and after the American Revolution. So as, as the years went by, she uh, had the opportunity to be released, but she chose to stay. Okay, So many captives, especially women, once adopted and integrated into an Indian community, refused the op opportunity to return home, finding life in Indian society much more rewarding. Okay, <clears throat> Let's watch our last film for... Part one, anyway, um, and this is entitled Part Four Four Captivity Na Narratives: White Women Who Prefer Native Life. Please watch that. This is a this is a lecture from a, a professor. A, uh, that's that's very interesting. Go ahead and watch that and come on back. <clears throat> okay, as she got older, her husband and her Seneca husband and Mary <clears throat> uh, moved to New York and around the area of the Genesee River. And as the years went by, of course, here's a here's an image of her, uh, you know, much later in life. She she remained tied to the native ways, but she lived near a doctor in Western New York who who wrote a book about her called The White Woman of the Genesee by James Seaver. So James Seaver writes writes this story about her life, uh, and she became known as the White Woman of the Genesee. Okay, so this book was very popular. And sold over 100,000 copies uh, in 1824, which is a, a, a huge amount of <clears throat> copies to sell in that era. Okay, so the, so the captivity narratives have a different spin that we don't always hear about. Yes, they were brutal. Yes, Mary saw her family killed in front of her, atrocities, uh, you know, uh, ritual killings, scalpings, uh, mutilations, uh, awful. But once you get past that and join the tribe and get into their lifestyle, many women felt that they had more opportunity and rights being with the natives than they did back in the patriarchal English colonies where, of course, they were dominated by males. OK, OK, that is the end of part one of chapter three. Please go to part two.